It's the state of the dungeon. It's a video that Rob does about his games. Yeah! Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Rob here in the Lair of Omnisci to deliver once more my state of the dungeon address. This was the game that took place on the 7th of January, 2021. And does that sound good? Anywho, you're still hoping 21 is better than 20 was. Uh, the game is Ghostbusters. Uh, we have a team of six players for this. And they created characters on site at the beginning of the session. The characters are Billy Redcliffe. Uh, he is a, an occult bookworm. He is also the son of the person who procured the Ghostbuster franchise for the group uh, as a 21st birthday present for Billy. So he is the money guy. He's also very smart and uh, savvy as far as occult goes. Uh, we also have Ben Schwartz. He is the local jock football star running back. Um, not the brightest, but big and strong and fast. We have Schmidt, just Schmidt. He is the opportunist manipulator. He, though he doesn't act it all the time, he has layers of cool which get him out of trouble in social situations and allow him to, uh, to, to deal with people easily, more so than almost anybody else. We have Jimmy Lecker. Uh, he is a show-off. And uh, a little bit of a loner. So we have Cassie Crenshaw. She is the new age amateur psychic, but she actually has some vestiges of the site, which gives her insight as to supernatural activities that are around in the area, which naturally draw her into this story. And we have Maggie Fenhouse. She is the smart and spunky, uh, just kind of all-arounder who works with, uh, works with the folks, uh, does a lot of the thinking. You know, just generally is that kind of person that's always good to have around for ideas. All of them are young adults in the Fond du Lac area. They are acquainted with each other, and their various skills uh, complement each other to the point where... They agreed to work with Billy to start up a Fond du Lac chapter of Ghostbusters. So, uh, Mr. Redcliffe gave them a house which he has acquired. It was abandoned, uh, but it's in a residential section of town because of zoning. Uh, technically, the uh, Ghostbusters... Uh, were able to, since they are taking place inside of an actual house, still able to operate inside of a residential area through loopholes. And the uh, Ghostbusters uh, delivery vehicle came and installed the uh, containment unit that they will use to store ghosts and left a huge box in front of the house. The house is not very impressive. It clearly has not been maintained in a while, so they've got some work to do. But inside of this massive black box with the Ghostbuster symbol on each side was all of the gear. Now in Ghostbusters, the gear is all on cards. They have a finite number of resources. So in the process of having these finite number of resources, not everybody can load themselves up with everything. Everybody can only carry up to three items, and they need the cards for the item in order to have it. So they had this, just this pile of stuff, and the group worked to move this stuff into the house. After looking around the general area and having some light roleplay opportunities amongst each other, as they kind of got to, to be familiar with their characters a little bit. For the most part, uh, things went relatively smoothly. They started exploring around the house. Um, several members took advantage of uh, the opportunity to uh, explore around. For example, Billy started looking at the containment unit and figuring out how that all worked. 
Um, Jimmy decided he was going to go through the house and look to see if there are any secrets. And he ended up discovering the attic. Uh, which, there's no stair to, it's just a hole in the roof of a closet. Uh, but he was determined to get up into it. The others uh, got to react, however, when Billy was accosted by an actual ghost of an old uh, half torso, just as uh, down to his, uh, what would be the stomach, uh, an apparition of an old deranged man with a large musket, who seemed to be very upset in his uh, heavily accented voice. The, how they've got this darn whatever in the house. And uh, the, the containment unit was clearly irritating him to the point where he materialized and attacked Billy. Uh, his musket spattered out black goo, and Billy dodged, which was good. And he immediately started running up to the living room where the big pile of gear was. Now, as he was running up... Well, Ben heard that, and he's like, oh, I want to go down and see. Unfortunately, seeing a ghost for the first time panicked Billy. Billy's, or sorry, Ben. Ben is, Ben has got a big heart, but not a lot up here. So his resistance to fright and things gets the better of him sometimes. And he turned and he ran. Uh, so they both run up. At the same time, uh, Cassie hears there's a ghost, so she immediately wants to go and check it out. So she runs, and because there is a, uh, a, a something of a disaster mechanic, every time you roll dice, one of the dice you roll has a chance of coming up uh, as a one, which spells some sort of complication. She runs through the ghost and gets slimed. Ectoplasm just drips off of her, and it's nasty, it's repulsive, and generally not that pleasant. Uh, it's also, uh, at the same time, Maggie, uh, was the first one to grab something off the pile. She grabbed a camcorder because she wanted to get film of this thing. So she started shooting. She managed to resist the fear of seeing a ghost, and she's got a lot of brains. So she stood there and tried recording as best as she could, but even she was not able to, you know, walk up and touch it or anything because this ghost was clearly hostile. It was a class 3 uh, apparition. And so she started backing up. Well, at this time, the Ghostbusters 2B were up at the top, and they're like, well, there's a pile of... Hey, there's proton packs up here. We know those are supposed to work on ghosts. So several of them started grabbing proton packs. Now, Ben grabbed a proton pack, and uh, when he went downstairs because he heard Billy shriek. He dropped the proton pack when he was running away. Cassie, through the slime, uh, saw that pack there, and she knew what those things are for. Um, there's enough popular media about the Ghostbusters that everybody was at least basically familiar with the workings of the Ghostbusters. So she went over to the pack, which was sparking a little bit from how it was dropped, a little roughed up, and so she puts it on and starts getting ready to go. Now, up at the living room, Ben had run back and he grabbed another proton pack. And he was determined that he was going to zap this ghost. So he points. Nothing happens. Doesn't work. Because anybody who's seen the movie knows, they have to be turned on first. These weren't turned on. So it was cold. And it didn't run. Well... At the same time, Schmidt realized what wasn't working there. He decided that because he likes to make himself look better, he was going to show up Ben uh, and his, his botch. So he makes a cool test, not to zap the ghost, but just to turn it on, prep himself, and look awesome. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, the skill that he tried to employ was seduction. He was trying to seduce the ghost. To what end, I'm not entirely certain. But anyhow, he rolled, and he got over a 30 on the roll. He's very good at that. And when he...
when he got to that point, well, the ghost had his undivided attention as strange feelings welled up in the ghost. But they were basically interpreted as rage to attack Schmidt if he can. So by this time, the others start getting proton packs and getting ready, and the first zaps start taking place. Um, Schmidt hits it. Billy grabs a pack and he hits it. Ben, after watching what Schmidt did, turns on his pack, but the way that Schmidt did it was bypassing all of the safeties, just basically going from a cold, uh, not activated, to I'm going to fire. Not generally recommended. You want to build up a charge first. So he, uh, he also did exactly what Schmidt did, which is, again, is not safe, but they were both fortunate. Nothing bad happened. And the ghost was menacing, and as it was getting zapped, it was getting more and more bestial as it was getting tired. Uh, at this point, Maggie was trying to film the whole thing, and she realized that they needed to trap the ghost. So she grabbed a trap, and while still trying to record it, kicks the ghost trap over by the ghost. Doesn't do the world's greatest job of it. But she gets it in the area so that if they actually can subdue the ghost, they can then trap it. So that was good. Now, at this point, the ghost is kind of getting tired of this. It's made several attacks, but it didn't hit anybody. My dice weren't good. And they were lucky, and they were pretty smart about how they, they tacked on, tackled the ghost. So the ghost decided it was going to use one of its powers to... One of its few actual powers was to disapparate and try to escape by dematerializing. And it's a defensive maneuver that allows it to shake off control from these uh, proton streams. It didn't work against the stream Billy had him in, which was trying to, the stream was trying to snare around and catch him. But he was still just a little too strong, but it did break the control that Schmidt had and that, um, sorry, actually Ben, I think, was the one who had, no, no, it was Schmidt who had control because he was using that stream to keep the ghost at bay so couldn't directly physically attack him. The others lost their stream. So Ben swings around and he hits him again. And this is all draining the ghost's strength with these proton streams. Billy, in what has become kind of a running thing, uh, rolled misfortune scythe the, the stream around, did some damage to the surrounding, to the, the, the architecture of the building, which needs work anyhow, it's not anything critical. But he hit a reflective surface and bounced the stream back and scorched his arm. So he took some damage. So, also at the same time, Schmidt decided he was going to try to uh, help to stop the ghost, but he rolled a misfortune on a dodge, and he ended up stepping into a ghost trap and broke it. So that wasn't good. Uh, while this was going on, however, Jimmy was checking out the attic, and he opened up the panel, jumped up, and pulled himself up into the attic, and he could see, because there were enough openings to let light in, not that the window was so grimy you barely could see through. But he saw that the room was full of steamer trunks and mannequins. Lots and lots of mannequins. All arranged in different poses. Some of them dressed. Some with wigs. It's creepy. And even made more creepy by the fact there's an active ghost and his friends were downstairs fighting the ghost at the same time. So once he sees this, and he's kind of unnerved by this, he leaves and heads back downstairs to see what help he can provide. Well, after this point, uh, Maggie hits the ghost trap, but unfortunately her camera runs out of tape, so she doesn't record the actual capture. They keep zapping the ghost until eventually it's at the point where it is exhausted and bound by uh, multiple streams. Schmidt decides he's going to walk it over into the trap, so he rolls against his wrestle skill. He's basically using the stream as a lever to force it where he wants it to go. And he wrestles, because he's very good at that, he wrestles it into the cone of the ghost trap and 
they catch their first ghost. It was great. Nice tutorial showing them how it's done. I had a, I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, we had enough misfortune and mischance, but they actually managed to pull through. So, after this they got a little bit of time to roleplay. And then Billy was determined that he was going to put the ghost trap into the containment unit to put the ghost into the grid. When he was interrupted, they had a new visitor. Somebody they may see again. His name is Eugene Nettle, and he's from the Department of Natural Resources as a branch of the Environmental Protection Agency. In Wisconsin, the DNR is pretty powerful, and they are the ones who are directly taking an interest in these Ghostbusters. Because there is a motion due to certain uh, congressmen that the ghosts in Wisconsin are actually a natural resource. They serve to encourage tourism for people to come and see haunted sites. So as a result, there's some feedback and there's some resistance to the idea that Ghostbusters would be running around scooping up ghosts from Wisconsin. So he gave them a huge stack of paperwork basically saying, I'll be back in a week to make sure this is all done. And you, if you step out of line, I will fine you and have you suspended. On and on and on. So, he's clearly going to be a foil. He is a five foot four balding man wearing an impeccable beige suit. And he talks like this and he's not going to take your crap from anything. Ben took a particular liking to him. So, uh, that was fun. Moving onward, uh, they finally put the ghost in the trap. Most of them got a chance to take a look at how it was done. It is relatively uh, simple and foolproof. But the first time you want to make a brains test just to see if you do it, and they're going to keep Ben away from it, I suspect. So, that's good. Ben got bored and decided he wanted to watch TV. The problem was the house didn't have a TV, but they do have that psychospectral analysis device. Yeah, no, the one that they had on Lewis Tully's head in Ghostbusters 1 that revealed that he was a, uh, you know, hellhound? Yeah. Complete with a colander and wires all hooked up. Well, he ripped all that stuff off and figured out a way to turn it back into a TV at the expense of their psychoanalysis detector. So. They have three items right now that are that are damaged or broken. The proton pack that is sparking, the ghost trap that was stepped on, and that box. So they called up the Ghostbusters because they have a copy of the contract for the franchise. And it says the Ghostbusters will repair or replace anything that's broken. Nothing about how much it'll cost, but realistically, not very many people are as smart as Egon about those things. So you really don't want to have an amateur trying to fix your, your stuff. It is possible for Ghostbusters to have significantly high skills that could take a crack at it, but um, they're not those guys. I don't think there's anybody who has the electrical uh, repair or uh, some of the other skills required, physics and stuff. So, they were successful, they got that first... Uh, first little bit underway, Billy got contacted by his dad saying, hey, how's everything going? Oh, everything's great. Uh, while Cassie's up taking a shower and getting the slime off. Um, and he's like, okay, well, hey, I'm going to try sending uh, business your way. I want you to be successful, son. So they get a call shortly thereafter from a Haas Zettler wanting to meet them at the Ramada Hotel. And he gave them a number, said, hey, I've got a job for you. I'm willing to pay you to take care of a problem. So they went to go and meet Ha Seller. Now when they do, there's you know, they, they they go through, they talk to the 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 secretary <laughs> who who did not like to see them coming around with their their cosplay things like their Ghostbusters. There's no convention here, you'll have to go outside. They managed to talk their way into the elevators and went up to go and meet with Mr. Zettler. Uh, Mr. Zettler is a tall Texan who wears an impeccable white uh, suit, huge white 10-gallon hat, white cowboy boots, the whole nine yards, rhinestones on the lapels. And he told them that he is a property developer who has turned his attention to Wisconsin, basically for vacation places for his friends. He's recently acquired a mansion 
a rather notorious mansion that has been uh, uh, the local haunting spot for quite a while. Most people are just don't have the courage to go to this place. Some few do, but it's got just bad juju written all over it. So he wants them to clear it because it is supposed to be haunted and he sent restoration crews in and they left on the first day. No contact back to him. Not even to ask for their one day's payment. So he wants them to go and investigate. Not necessarily hire them to bust anything because they don't know that there are ghosts there. But he wants them to go and investigate it. And as a warning, uh, because they're in the Ghostbusters universe, most people don't have any doubts that there are ghosts. I mean, you can see them in the Ghostbusters universe. They exist. Um, and if nothing else, there was the New York incident of 86 where you had the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, a 100-foot demonic marshmallow construct that got detonated all over Times Square. The cleanup alone fed the, the sugar dreams of 1,000, 1,000 children. But, more to the point, uh, Ghost Hunters, you know those charming shows that you see on the Discovery Channel or whatnot, they don't exist because we know there are ghosts. So instead there are Ghost Experience Hunters. They're the ones who go out and they try to provoke the ghosts into showing up so that they can get pictures of them because people love ghosts. And they love seeing these daring people who go out and confront the supernatural. So the group that he had to look into them, he didn't really vet them very well because they are the ghost badgers. Uh, badger being the uh, state animal for Wisconsin, the name you know, that the athletic teams for the UW Medicine have, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, unfortunately, they have a reputation for being a little bit rough on the surroundings to provoke reactions. So. The group is being paid a lot of money. Their standard fees, plus he's offering them $50,000 if they don't damage the house. And any repairs that need to be done off of what they do will be taken off of that $50,000. So they've got a good incentive to try their best to not do any serious damage. So. After kind of, you know, futzing around and uh, looking into, uh, you know, a few things here and there, uh, they decide that they are going to go to the, the site. Uh, there's a little bit of, of, of looking into a few things. They go and they grab jumpsuits, for example. They, they run to the local fleet farm and they get Carhartt jumpsuits. And they get boots and everything. They have a fund for that, so that doesn't cost anybody anything. At this point, I also let all of them kind of take their own personal items. They go from useful, like Billy grabbing $1,000 in cash for expenses, makes sense, to Schmidt, who wanted licorice. I love comedy games. So at any rate, they eventually go out to the site. This is the Bichel Mansion. And it is, again... A place that has been abandoned for more than 50 years. It looks the part. It is kind of falling apart, although it's still structurally sound. And it's on a 30 acres of land that is mostly overgrown. The time we're playing in is late spring, so a lot of this is last year's growth that's starting to kind of perk up again. So there's burdock and witch hazel and all kind of poison oak and such all over the place. It's really hard to see the yard itself, except that there clearly was an orchard in the, the far western uh, corner of the property. Those trees have are dead and rotting. Uh, there was obviously some sort of a hilly feature, perhaps around some sort of a garden that's now completely overgrown, and there's vines and things, creepers that are coming up around the, the house. There's also two vehicles that are in the driveway. <clears throat> Uh, one of them is this Dodge Charger, absolutely gorgeous, with airbrushed ghosts kind of fleeing along the sides of it. And the other one is a trailblazer full of gear. Standing on the porch of this house are a woman who is dressed to attract attention. She's basically dressed like Lara Croft, the Tomb Raider franchise fame. Uh, in tactical hot pants and a belly-bearing shirt with suspenders and uh, 
instead of guns at her uh, garter holsters, uh, she instead has handy cams. And she is working herself up in front of a camera with a tall, uh, lanky assistant next to her, uh, psyching herself up to go into this place. So, as they arrive, the product manager, uh, his name is uh, Dan Rodriguez, comes out and he tells them, um, hey guys, uh, you're... Your Ghostbusters, you've got gear and stuff, you've got packs and stuff. We heard that there was going to be some Ghostbusters in the area, but this house hadn't been touched yet. Um, we're shooting a show, so maybe we can make this work work out. He seems to be pretty savvy. He's like, okay, look at it this way. If Cassie, Cassie Stone is their, their, their power pack of a girl and she's their front person, if Cassie goes in there, she's usually pretty good at stirring up things. So if there's a ghost, she'll draw it out, which will make things easier for you if you're there to get rid of the ghost. But it'll allow us to shoot our show first if we can go in there undisturbed. We'd really appreciate that. And and this the grounds here are immense. You could go over the grounds and check for anything that might cause this haunting. You know, a, a murdered body somewhere, or maybe some ancient artifact that's causing these things. And just leave the house for the time being so that we can get our first crack into it. Without having anybody else kind of trampling in on us. The group, for the most part... Were, were pretty mollified by his ideas. They seemed to be fairly sensible, and again, uh, they really weren't in that much of a hurry to go and rush into danger. So they all employed their own tactics. For instance, Jimmy went to explore the grounds. He actually did what the guy said and realized that yeah, everybody else is really concentrating on the house. So he went off, and through a very good bit of success, he found in one corner that there's actually a graveyard. It's in the far eastern corner of the lot. And yeah, there are all these ancient gravestones. Most of them are so weather-worn that you can't really see who they are, but there's dead bodies on the premises. That's probably not going to come into play. So the others are going around with their various tools and scanning around the house using proper PKE tools. And they find quite quickly when they successfully use the tools that these particular premises are definitely haunted. The house itself is radiating at a strong 4 out of 10 uh, for PKE energy, so there is definitely a haunting that's going on there, or something major. Uh, at various points, it's also ebbing and swelling, so whatever it is, is moving throughout the house. It's at this point that uh, Cassie goes in uh, to the house with her assistant, and they start putting in sensors and all the other little trinkets that uh, ghost experiencers use. Uh, at this point, Schmidt decides he's going to go follow them and record them and see what happens. So he takes the camera and he goes in. They're not happy to see him, but Schmidt don't care. <laughs> Schmidt feeds them a line that he's the groundskeeper. Not very convincingly. Um... But he, he baffles them rather than gets them angry at first. Because he does have, he's pretty smooth as a character. The others go around with their sensors and uh, admittedly some of them are grubbing to the point where they want to get in at the windows and try to break up some of the shots of these ghost badgers and, 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 and interfere slightly in their own way. Um... The, the psychic Cassie starts going around with her crystals and trying to feel the energies, and she can definitely feel there's a force. As a matter of fact, while Maggie is using the PKE meter, a force comes swooping out of the... It's invisible, except for on the PKE meter, she's able to see it. Uh, a, a force reaches out, grabs Cassie, and gives her just a terrible experience. A piercing headache that causes her to shriek and drop to the ground, and this just overwhelming feeling of dread. It's a, it's a ghostly attack, but it's over quite quickly. So at this point, um, Maggie has the evidence, and Cassie definitely knows there's something wrong going on here. The others kind of go around to see what's, what's happening, and it's at this point where things start going off the rails in a big way. 
See, at this point, uh, Cassie Stone, the leader of the Ghost Badgers, starts getting really annoyed with Schmidt. It just, she flips like a switch. All of a sudden, his being there is getting her angry. And she gets in his face. She sticks the finger in his face and is yelling at him. Now, Schmidt does not fight back. He tries talking his way out of it. But eventually, he rolls in his fortune, and she throws a punch at him. Now, it misses. He does dodge the punch. And he decide, and he finds out she's much stronger than he is. But he is a skilled grappler, and he decides to stop her from punching me. I'm going to have to try to grab and restrain her. There aren't a lot of ways to do that that don't look bad. But when the others start kind of coming up around the door and looking, he is grappling at Cassie. And she is throwing elbows and knees at him. At the same, almost the same time, actually the thing that triggered Cassie, really, was uh, on random chance, a picture that was hanging up on the wall, dirty, filthy, fell off the wall and landed on the assistant. Basically, his head punched through the rotted canvas, and now he's wearing the frame over his shoulders. Cassie thought that Schmidt had pulled it down. So Ms. Stone got, got mad and started swinging. That led to the grappling. Now, the other folks start coming in because they want to help out, but the sensors that the ghost badgers had put into place suddenly explode. Plastic and, and metal shards go flying all over the place. Nobody is unduly hurt by this. Nothing too terrible. But Schmidt and Cassie are, are avoided, and uh, the others are suddenly having to react to this. And they all get this vague sense of undirected but definitely palpable terror. Nobody really falls for it except for Ben, who kind of starts backing up. But even he manages to control himself pretty well. It's at this time where Schmidt starts to get nervous about how Cassie could really hurt him. Uh, she is quite strong, and she is attacking with almost frenzied force. And at one point, he looks at her, and he sees her eyes are actually glowing red. Not figuratively, literally are glowing red for a moment. He's like, I've got to stop this. So he decides he's going to go for a takedown rather than try a chokehold, because she's expertly avoiding chokeholds. So he reaches his hands around his, her midsection and tries bridge suplexing her back to get her to the ground so that he can go on top of her, pin her, and stop her from hurting him. The assistant is feebly trying to, to nail him with the picture frame to get him off of Cassie, because it's not the optics on this are not good. However... Cassie has this sudden wrenching force and perhaps a little bit more than her own natural strength that pulls her around so that she's on top of Schmidt. And as Schmidt falls back, he plunges through the floor. Floorboards snap as if the floor was no stronger than cardboard. And he plummets down into the basement, which is mildewy and dank and... That pleasant, and certainly nothing you want to drop in on from the floor above. He doesn't get impaled on the boards or anything, but it's certainly not pleasant, and it does cause him to lose some of his grip. The rest of the group is like, wow, I just plunged through the floor, so they want to react, they want to do something. It's at this point where things just start going bonkers. A large carpet rises up and tries to smother Ben, who gets out of the way of it. He's very nimble. The Geiger counter that... Billy is carrying with him, suddenly starts snaking around and trying to attack uh, Ben. But I can roll the ghost die too. And if, if I roll misfortune, it suddenly realizes that it doesn't have enough cord to get Ben. So it's snapping like a snake, but just can't get to him, which was comical. Jimmy decides he's going to go around and he's going to try to help uh, Schmidt. So he actually tackled the assistant so that he couldn't interfere in the fight. So when Schmidt falls through the floor, Jimmy had kind of grappled the assistant, but they had he wasn't as gifted at grappling as Schmidt is, and basically kind of let him go. So they were both prone on the floor. 
trying to figure out what's going on because this is this has just been bedlam solid bedlam the girls cassie and maggie were a little hesitant at going into the house because they'd had that psychic experience so instead they went back to the car to gather gear this time they're getting the proton packs ghost traps the stuff that they would use if, to defend themselves against ghosts the goggles uh, everything they needed Again, still limited to three items, but at the, up to this point, nobody really had the proton packs because they were just there for, you know, recon. Now they kind of thought they'd need them to save everybody. So as they're coming back, they see there's the hole in the floor. And they see that, uh, once again, there's this force, this psychic force that keeps attacking Ben who does not have a strong resistance to this force, and it keeps making him run out of the house and then get his courage back, and he goes back inside wanting to spoil for a fight and then attacks his mind again because it's, it's, he's like a it's puppet for some reason. So the girls come in and see this. At this point, uh, they're quickly pulling out PKE meters, Billy and Maggie, and they are trying to find out where the ghost is. Maggie gets a good lock on it with her very good brains trait, and she ends up finding that in the center of the foyer, there's a large spiritual force that is sending out uh, ectotheric tentacles that are manipulating things. They keep attacking Ben and assaulting his mind. They keep... Uh, they actually are reaching into the floor and actually changing how the house is, actually warping the joist out of the way so that there was a soft spot where Schmidt would fall down with Cassie. And also telekinetically controlling things like the Geiger counter. So they kind of knew where the target was, but it wasn't materialized in such a way that they could really zap it or do anything to it. Billy also found this out after getting his, his uh, PKE meter to work. And uh, he moves forward and tries to tries to see what he can do to help. Because Schmidt was stunned, he kind of lost some of his grip on Cassie. And now Cassie is fully in the grip of a full-on bloodthirsty rage. She coiled her legs back and snapped them forward like she was trying to kip up. But instead of propelling her upper body, which was still somewhat restrained by Schmidt, she instead lashed her heels backwards to connect with a tender part of Schmidt. That hit, Schmidt was hurting. And that caused him to let her go, so she popped up and pretty much was standing on him. Now at this point, Ben actually went for, for there was an exchange where Ben didn't get attacked mentally. But Cassie, the, the, the Ghostbuster Cassie, felt a force which she just could not resist. Again, misfortune occurred. And she suddenly felt an incredible amount of rage towards Billy. Because he's so smug. He's rich. He's all this. So she was kind of compelled to go and grab her ghost trap, the heaviest thing she had that was maneuverable, in both hands. And she crept up as he was bending over the hole to smack him in the back and knock him into the hole what was quite possibly one of the worst rolls of the entire night happened. She completely whiffed over him, spun, and fell into the hole. Again, right on top of Schmidt. Schmidt was not having a good night. At least as far as this, con this, this occurrence was concerned. He felt even more pain as she landed on him, and Cassie was preparing to start stomping with her Doc Martens. Fortunately, I let him use his wrestling skills in a defensive mode to try to get himself to safety. As a matter of, you know, half of wrestling is actually protecting yourself from the offensive moves of your opponents. So I, I thought it was fair uh, from him freeing himself from being pinned by one of his allies, whose eyes also were glowing, he noticed. And just faintly, not nearly as strong as Cassie's, which are full on glowing now, as she pre starts preparing to stomp down on his you know, stomach and sensitive areas. So he manages to scurry into a fetal position against one wall and get out of immediate harm. Um, so many strange things happen. So 
I did. I mean, I, this is not a complete play-by-play. -play. A lot of other things happened, but it, this is the gist of what happened. The comedy of errors. They have not done any offensive things about the actual ghost. The ghost has not manifested. It has merely been doing all of these things, but all kinds of things at the same time, revealing that it's a pretty powerful spook. When they actually scan the thing, it comes up as about a 7.5 out of 10. And, you know, considering that there's Gozer and Stay Puft Marshmallow Man that crest above 10, that's really powerful for a starting Ghostbuster. So, at present, uh, they're kind of in a hard spot. Uh, Schmidt is no longer pinned, but uh, Cassie is still under the sway of this absolute hatred of men that seems to really be gripping her. And Cassie is also, the, the Cassie Ghost Badger is also still enraged, but now uh, what happens, Billy kind of you know, tried to jump down and, and tackle Cassie so she would stop going after Schmidt, this is Cassie Stone. Uh, he didn't do so well because uh, at one point, which led up to it, her assistant tried jumping down into the hole with her. And instead of helping him, uh, well, he basically botched to fall in, but instead of helping him, she grabbed his arm and slammed him on the back of his head and shoulders and completely knocked him out. She showed supernatural knowledge of what was coming, because she didn't have any idea this guy was coming to get her. So when Billy dives at her, uh, she tries to grab him the same way. He was far more successful in hitting her, though. So he knocks her away, uh, but now he himself is actually hanging uh, up on the... No, I take it back. He fell to the ground as well. Ben tried helping out, but he is now blind because, well, he tried turning on his visors inside. They're light amplification goggles that let you see in the dark. It's light in this room. It's daylight. So he hurt his eyes. And he was filled with a sudden rage himself. So he charged at the hole. He stopped himself from falling in the hole. He is holding on to the side, and Cassie is sizing him up for a punch. Uh, again, someplace he doesn't want to be punched either. So at present, as the, as, as the way it all ends, Schmidt is whimpering and, and curled up in a fetal position in the basement. Um, Billy Redcliffe is down in the basement as well. Ben is hanging, still in the foyer, but his, his lower part, uh, parts are hanging down into the basement. Uh, Cassie is down. She is clear-headed enough to act on her own, although she's going to have a hard time uh, dealing with men. Uh, that seems to be an issue. Uh, Cassie Stone is down there, and she looks for all the world like a world killer right now, because she's clearly possessed of strength beyond her own. Um, and she's growling in anger and frustration. Um, oh, Jimmy's still up on top, so they, he's still an asset. Cassie is, or, uh, Maggie is still up in the foyer, so she can help out as need be. Uh, so the group is a little spread out right now, and several of them are in the basement, kind of cut off. But the staircase isn't too far away. They can get back upstairs if they need to. Uh, as things stand right now, it's been very tense, but mostly hilarious, as everybody is uh, quickly laughing at the misfortunes of themselves and each other. Um, everything has been going perhaps not as planned, but it has been interesting. And it has been exciting. There's a lot of promise in this group. Now, one uh, thing that uh, they will probably have to be reminded on is that uh, they can use brownie points, which are basically the system of how much damage they can take, but also how fortunate they're feeling. They can spend brownie points to give themselves extra dice and dice rolls if they feel they need it. So far, nobody has done that, so that might be something I'll have to remind them of. But by and large, they jumped into their characters, did an admirable job, and it promises really good things for this group. So, that's my State of the Dungeon report. Uh, I am Rob. Thank you for joining me, and uh, this Ghostbusters team is far from done. So, we'll talk to you next time. 
So from the letter of Amnesty, thank you and farewell.